Well, good evening. And welcome to the State's Attorney's Office Third Annual Drug Overdose and Prevention Vigil. I'm Brian DeLeonardo, the State's Attorney for Carroll County. Tonight, I am very pleased to not only have an amazing number of you here with us, but I also welcome all of those that are watching at home as Carroll Media Center is broadcasting this event live for the community as a whole. At this time, I would ask that you rise for the presentation of the colors. If you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you can be seated. Prior uh, to beginning this evening, I hope you had to take, to take some time to look at the memorial tables, as well as the video of the many lives that have been lost way too early due to drugs. It is difficult to follow a video when you watch those lives, to see mothers and fathers brothers, sisters, best friends that have lost their lives to drug addiction. The loss is not only painful to their loved ones, but it is a painful loss to the entire community. Last year in this county, 46 people lost their lives to drug overdoses. It is a staggering number, but we are not here to talk about numbers because behind these numbers are real people, real families, real friends, many of you who are here tonight. While some may have a stereotypical view of the user, it is simply not the reality. These are mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and best friends that are no different than anyone else. The face of addiction certainly comes in many forms. The last several years, I've spoken to many parents around the county that have lost children to drugs. And I have heard how their child was a Boy Scout, played high school sports, was an accomplished musician, straight A student, a very caring and loving person that always volunteered their time to help others in need until addiction set in. Too often I heard that the parents did not realize that heroin or prescription drugs was even a problem. And when they did find out there was a problem with their child, didn't know where to turn for help once they learn their child had that addiction. It is my hope tonight that you will hear a message that resonates with you. If you have lost a loved one, I hope you take comfort in knowing that you are in a room full of people that care about your loss, and we want to prevent others from experiencing that same pain. Your loss is, in fact, a loss shared by us all. If you're in recovery, I hope you have the chance to see a community that wants to desperately support and encourage you in your path of recovery. If you are in the throes of addiction, I hope you will see that there is hope for a different way, a different life, through the stories of those that have walked a similar path, that you can indeed recover. And if you are a member of the community, has an interest in this issue, I hope you will see that your law enforcement our elected leaders, 
our treatment providers, our emergency personnel, our court officials are all working together and working very hard to try to end this tragic and senseless loss of life that is happening. Now, it should be noted that so many police agencies and elected officials came tonight and supported this community effort. And I, I do think, even in this vigil, it is important to acknowledge that they are present tonight because I think it does show the support that you have from all aspects of this community. Um, and I can tell you that their help has been many ways in a public way and that I've certainly seen their support of our efforts in many private ways as well. So I'm going to recognize some of them and I would ask just if you could hold your applause to the end. Uh, tonight we have Senator Justin Reedy with us, Delegate Susan Krebs, Delegate Haven Shoemaker, and Delegate, Delegate April Rose. Um, that is all in presence. We have our County Commissioner Steve Wantz, Dennis Frazier, and, and Richard Rothschild with us tonight. From the Carroll County Board of Education, we have President, President Devin Rothschild, Virginia Harrison, Bob Lord, Donna Savigny, and Superintendent Steve Guthrie. And in addition from our courts, I would like to recognize that we have Circuit Court Judge Rich Titus with us as well here tonight. So I want to thank you all very much for coming this evening. And if I missed any, I apologize, but there's a lot of people out here. So I, if I did, I certainly appreciate that. As to our law enforcement partners, they see firsthand in responding to the devastation that drugs have on our community. And they know the pain that families and friends go through as a result of this addiction. So I would like to acknowledge the department heads of these agencies represented here tonight. They will have officers actually at the end that will be holding the main candles for everyone to approach during the candle lighting portion of this evening. Maryland State Police Westminster Barrett Commander Lieutenant Patrick McCrory, Carroll County Sheriff Jim DeWeese, Westminster Police Chief Jeff Spaulding, Manchester Police Chief John Hess, Sykesville Police Chief Mike Spaulding, Hampstead Police Chief Stephen Gossage, McDaniel College Chief Jim Hammerin. I thank you all very much for your support. So to conclude my opening remarks, I would simply say that in the end, my hope is that from this vigil, there will be a loud and clear message that we have and will continue to come together to shine a light on the epidemic that is too often hidden in the darkness. Um, at this time, um, as many of you know, Governor Larry Hogan knows full well the challenges we face in Carroll County and throughout Maryland when it comes to drug overdoses and deaths. Recently, uh, both he and the Lieutenant Governor came to Carroll County and spoke of the great efforts being undertaken on many fronts to address this issue by the state, including declaring a state of emergency to bring more resources to bear. I can tell you when he was uh, running to be governor, I had the opportunity to have really good discussion with him about this issue. And um, we just talked about it again recently where he remarked that he was going around the state and he kept hearing this issue about heroin and drug overdoses. And uh, I really appreciate his leadership on bringing this issue to light. Um, while he wasn't able to make it tonight because he was out of state, um, I'm very honored to have you know, a friend and the executive director of the Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention here this evening to share a few words with us. So at this time, I would ask uh, Glenn Fuston to please come forward. <clears throat> Good evening. How are you? Yeah, what a moving uh, video. As I was sitting there and I was watching it and uh, just thinking about all the lives lost, I'll, I'll have to admit, I was like, wow, I, I feel bad for the person that has to go right after that video. <laughs> and here I am. <clears throat> uh, but what a moving way uh, to show tribute to all those, those folks that we've lost since the, the last year. Um, it's amazing. I hope that that video is much shorter next year. Um, I wanted to thank you all for uh, allowing me to come speak with you tonight. Uh, and especially to thank uh, your state's attorney, uh, Brian DiLeonardo, for putting this event together uh, and, and keeping the memory alive 
um, for all those victims that we've had uh, and for putting on the third annual drug overdose and prevention visual. So I'd like to give him a round of applause yeah. as well. <laughs> it's truly an honor uh, to be here tonight and to represent the governor uh, and all the, the work that the governor is doing uh, in this space of substance abuse uh, and around uh, the world of opiate overdoses, uh, but just in substance abuse is in general. Uh, it's events like these that are extremely important to bringing attention to the issue. Uh, it's collaboration. I, I talk about it quite a bit. The governor talks about it quite a bit. Uh, Brian talked about the collaboration that's in this room. It's multidisciplinary. You have education, you have law enforcement, you have treatment, you have prevention, you have everybody, you have the community in this room. I'm a very firm believer that until we get the community empowered, which you have here, I look around this room and you have an empowered community, that's when we're going to make a truly big difference. And I, I applaud you uh, for being here and trying to make a difference in the, in the community. Uh, the reality is that addiction can happen to anybody. You know that better than anyone. A big part of our effort <clears throat> to stem the tide is, tide is education and public awareness. Because believe it or not, some still don't understand the full impact that substance abuse can have on a community. Under Governor Hogan's leadership, our administration has been focusing on combating heroin and opioid crisis from every angle. And not just heroin and opioid crisis, but substance abuse in general, including prevention, treatment, enforcement, and recovery. Trying to find as many solutions as we possibly can. We're looking for new innovative solutions. We're looking for evidence-based solutions. We're looking for solutions that are gonna make a difference in the community each and every day. <clears throat> As you know, in March, the governor declared a state of emergency. This, uh, in response to the heroin and opioid uh, and fentanyl crisis, this crisis is ravaging communities. It's ravaging communities here in Carroll County. It's ravaging communities across the state of Maryland. This declaration activated the governor's emergency management team and allowed him to activate the Maryland Emergency Management System uh, and, uh, and allowed him to appoint Clay Stamp as the director of the Opioid Operational Command Center and leverage resources across the state. Again, multidisciplinary response from the uh, educational component, the treatment component, enforcement component to bring every possible resource we had at the state level to partner with our our uh, communities across the state to combat this effort. Just a key, couple weeks ago, Brian mentioned that we were out here. Uh, Governor Hogan brought his entire cabinet out here. Uh, at that time, we unveiled our Before It's Too Late media campaign, uh, along with it, the Before It's Too Late uh, MD.org website, uh, which is a full function website that brings together resources for a one-stop shop for individuals, families, educators. I encourage you to go to that website, provide feedback, let us know how we can improve it, but I hope that it can provide support to you in the community to help us fight this epidemic. <clears throat> Education goes hand in hand with prevention. And there's, are, there are many resources out there to get help <clears throat> to get your life back. And if you are ready, to, or if you're already in the throes of addiction, we hope that this website will help you find some of the resources that are out there. There's other sites that are available to you, like the Maryland Community Service Locator uh, that has services available to you as well. We encourage you to go to that. Prevention, treatment, recovery, before it's too late. That's what the message is that we're trying to send. We hope you'll help us spread that word to your family, to the loved ones, to the community, so that we can get it out there, so we can keep things moving forward in our, each of our communities across the state. It can be simple things, as simple as cleaning out your medicine cabinet, going through, finding those unused drugs that you don't need anymore, taking it to a safe facility, disposing of them so they can't get into the community. These are ways that we can get rid of these drugs. The governor has sponsored different events to, do that, to, to get rid of these drugs. You've seen that we had a national take back day just recently by, with DEA. We've sponsored events to bring Narcan into the community. We've sponsored different events to help in any way we possibly can. We want to hear from the community as well. How you think that we can help the community, we certainly are open to that door. We're partnering with agencies like Brian's office, like the law enforcement that you heard, the treatment offices, but we want to hear from the community as well. The biggest thing that I can say is you know that you have a friend in the governor. The governor ran on a platform of change. He wants to change Maryland for better. This is something that he ran on <clears throat> very early on. You heard Brian mention it. It's one of the first things that he talked to us about when he took office. He's talking about it before he took office. 
He has it. You have his ear. We're here to be a partner in this effort, and we hope that we can be here and a friend to listen to. Thank you very much. God bless. <clears throat> Thank you, Glenn, and I, I think it's important to hopefully for those in the community who are watching live to know those resources are available. And I couldn't follow the video with this section because uh, that was pr probably going to be too much to take, so I, I, I'm going to do it now. Um, you know, I, I think in losing a child uh, for any reason has got to be such an absolutely painful experience. Um, it certainly is uh, for many in this room because I know you have experienced that. You know, I often say when I talk that our children will make dumb mistakes. I have four that prove that every day. Um, the thing about what's going on in our community right now, however, is those dumb mistakes can become fatal. And, and that is what we're trying to deal with, because in this climate, you know, a decision to start down the path of using can lead to a downward spiral that can also ultimately cost them their lives. So I said, it can touch any, anybody's family, and no one is immune. Our next speaker is Christopher Eric Boucher, good friend that I've had the good fortune of crossing paths with many years ago. And I remember actually the first time that we met, uh, it was back in 2014. Um, I'm sorry, no, 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 2013. And we actually had a whole conversation about this issue and about the need to raise awareness on drugs, the importance of uh, the efforts that we talked about needed to be done. And um, you know, I, I could tell from, from the heart at that point that it was, was a, an issue that was very near and dear to him as it was for me. He's here tonight to sadly share for the very first time the story of his own loss. This time I ask Eric if you can come forward. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out this evening. Two years ago, I stood in the back of this hall, listening and watching, crying and praying, for I knew that my daughter was a heroin addict. And it was difficult for me to confront, but I've always tried to be as honest as I can all the time about it. That's why when I first met Mr. D. Leonardo, while I was running for the House of Delegates and he was running for his present seat, I brought it to his attention. Because I believe the only shame that exists is in denying that there is an addict in your family or denying that you are an addict yourself. You have to come clean with it. You have to face the issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. I found out that my daughter was an addict three and a half years ago while she worked for me and was embezzling from my business. It was devastating. It hurt me deep inside. This is a child who I love more than any other human being on the earth. This is my baby girl. And I was confronted with the fact that she was a heroin addict. She came clean with me when I discovered she was stealing from me. And at that point in time, I had a decision to make. Do I as a parent ignore what my daughter was doing? Or do I criminally charge my daughter and get her into the system? And for a month and a half, while the auditors checked over my books and discovered what she was doing to me, finally, after a year back on the audit, I said, stop the audit. That's enough. It's painful enough. I don't need to go back five years. I got enough evidence. I can go to the police. It was tough. I cried. I cried like a baby. But I knew that I had to address this issue for my daughter to try and save her life. And once you do that, both parents, and I cannot emphasize this enough, both parents, whether you're together or divorced or you're a step-parent, <clears throat> you must have the same position for your child to save their life. One of the parents cannot be the enabler or the facilitator. Just because you criminally charge your daughter or your child does not mean you do not love your child. It is tough, but it's that tough love that can potentially save a life. For if you ignore it and live in the shame, you're basically signing the death warrant to your child. Once you get your child into the system, the people in the system, such as the state's attorney's office, the sheriff's department, and even the bench or judges are loving, concerned parents just as you. 
They are bringing to bear all the resources they can to help save your children's lives or save your friends and loved ones' lives. They are not your enemy. They are there to help you. I just hope that all of you guys out there who have experienced the pain that I have can deal with it and hopefully manage it. For I know that having lost my baby girl, I will be scarred for life. It is something I cry about almost daily, and I don't think it will ever go away. And as someone who's been in public life and has a public image, I believe it's my responsibility to talk about this issue, this issue to as many people as possible to prevent them from suffering like I presently suffer now. So in closing, I say remember that our public officials, our judges, our state's attorney, our law enforcement, are not your enemy, they are your friend, and the governor and the lieutenant governor are doing everything they can to provide the support for them to press the resources we have publicly to save people's lives. May the Lord be with you all on this journey, and people facing their addiction, I hope that they recover, and it takes a higher power. It's not just a treatment. Eventually, you have to turn yourself over to your faith. It is truly God's power that can save your life because addiction is a horrible thing. Everyone must have faith and pray. Everyone have a good night and thanks for coming out. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I know how difficult that was. We've talked a couple times um, having just lost his daughter in February. Um, you can imagine the bravery, I think, that it took to get up here and share that with you. And I just want to thank you again. Uh, whether it's parents speaking out, like you did tonight, or those in recovery that are now dedicating their lives to helping others out of the darkness, or those in the community who want a better life for others, I am indebted to their efforts to help stop these tragic deaths. Tonight, um, I want to recognize two of those efforts that are helping us in Carroll County. And I think it's important for us to recognize the efforts of some in our community so that, uh, that you may not always hear about, but to understand what is going on in the efforts that are being put in. The first award is our Message of Hope Award. Um, this award begun last year and is given to a personal organization that works to deliver a message of sobriety, offers a better way of life. Last year, Beth Schmidt, I saw you earlier, where were you? There you go. Uh, last year was awarded that after um, the loss of her son to a drug overdose. She's worked tirelessly in his honor by speaking as to prevention, promoting treatment for others, and uh, that's why I recognized her last year. This year, I want to recognize a group of Carroll County High School students that have selflessly lended their talents and time to serve as actors to our school videos that we created with uh, Carroll Media Center for our middle school drug program. They came to every Carroll County High School with us to do live performances for the students. In addition, they deliver a message to students year-round that drug abuse leads to a downward spiral in many venues throughout Carroll County. We are so fortunate to have students like that in our schools who are willing to speak to other students on this topic, as they are certainly the key in investing in a more drug-free future in this county. And as a result, I'm honored to present this award to Foolproof, and I would ask the Director Paul Zimmerman and the students from Foolproof in attendance to come forward to receive this award. Thank you. They really were absolutely tremendous, and they've done many videos for us. And uh, it's funny sometimes when I see them, uh, when I'm out in the schools, I have to remember, oh, yeah, you're really not that bad. You know, you're actually playing a role because they are so persuasive. Um, 
and actually some of them, the one of them, I wonder if he'll ever get a date because <laughs> he, if you see him in the videos, he's like every mom's worst nightmare. <laughs> but then I talked to him and he's like a fabulous kid. So again, thank you very much. <laughs> That's not what you wanted on Carroll Media Center. Okay, I understand. Well, uh, the next award is sadly a new one. This year, Carroll County lost an irreplaceable fixture in the drug treatment community. Robert Kirkland was a veteran of the U.S. Navy who fought in Vietnam, was someone who's actively involved in several community organizations. He was importantly the first person open, openly in long-term recovery to be an active part of the court system in Carroll County as a treatment liaison and served that role for the bulk of his time with Mountain Manor Treatment Centers. He had 40 years of sobriety at the time he passed, but he would always tell everyone, I just have today, because he really did live one day at a time. I met Bob over 20 years ago when he was working to get people into treatment and on a path to better life. So to me, Bob was doing the essential work that needed to be done before it was cool. He was a mentor to those in the throes of addiction. He always answered his phone when someone needed him, never expecting anything in return. His humble character was one of his most admirable traits. Anyone who knew Bob would say that he went above and beyond what he was paid to do because he truly just had compassion and empathy for the people of our community who needed treatment. Everyone knew Bob, and this was without ever him having a smartphone, his old flip phone, or a camera that I thought you were going to have to pull one of the things up that would flash. <laughs> I got to tell you, one of the things I remember about Bob was he took the absolute worst pictures of me every time I saw him, and then he would drop them off about two weeks later when he got them developed. Uh, you knew uh, Bob from walking around the courthouse or visiting jails or from local recovery meetings. He was truly one of a kind. He even loved to play Santa for our state's attorney's office holiday party. As Circuit Court Judge he Fred Hecker, who oversees our drug court, recently said, the world would be a better place with more Bob Kirklands. And we lost him this year, and it is certainly a loss that I know is felt by many in this room. And just, I would just like to ask anybody that was touched by Bob Kirkland, if you would stand. So you can see, he certainly has reaches among a lot of different people. So, thank you. This year, in honor of Bob, uh, I wanted to name the Bob Kirkland Award. Candidates for this award should embody characteristics that are valuable above and beyond the regular job requirements of their field of work, but that often go unrewarded. He or she should demonstrate a genuine caring to improve the lives of those facing addiction, and be willing to go the extra mile to help them better their lives and thereby the lives of our community. They should inspire and set a good example through their principles and their actions. As some of you know, our drug treatment education and treatment liaison, Tim Weber, serves in our office in a position to offer 24-7, one-stop shop, that he can help people that are in addiction, help provide resources and guidance to those that need it, and to work with rising above addiction for detox and demand and the hopes that no one will be unable to break the overdose cycle for lack of funds or knowledge of treatment options. Our law enforcement has embraced this in the county, often calling Tim even from the scene of an overdose so that he can go out to the hospital or go out to their homes to see them. One officer with the full support of their former chief and current chief has frankly really set the standard in embracing this effort. So as I provide some background on the reason for the selection, I'd ask Lieutenant Stacy Gagler of Hampstead Police Department to come forward. And don't hide, because I saw you earlier. <laughs> Lieutenant? Where'd you go? Ah, oh, here we are. Come on up. <laughs> Just going to hold this for a sec. Just wait one second. Okay, while you hold here for a sec, I'm going to tell you a little bit about 
Stacy has been an exemplary example of community outreach and going above and beyond the call of duty to assist in helping individuals get treatment on demand. She has been instrumental for taking several individuals in Hampstead from overdosing to now being clean and sober. And I want to give some of these examples because I think hopefully for those in the community will understand the work that's being done on the ground. One example is when Lieutenant Gigler called Tim after hours about a young man who had walked into the Hampstead Police Department and asked for help after recently overdosing. She immediately called Tim and together they came up with a plan. She, Lieutenant Gigler then ensured that he was there, made sure he got to the McDonald's the next day um, and worked with Tim in helping convincing him the need for help and that he needed to get into treatment. So Tim picked him up, he was, he was really sick. He got sick three times on the way. Uh, to the Hope House of Laurel. But without question, that was just one example where her efforts in going the extra mile really made a difference in that young man's life. Another one's probably even more telling. It was a roadside stop where Hampstead Police had made a decision, rather than arrest for a small amount of drugs, to offer that person help. Lieutenant Gagler, with the support of Chief Ken Meekins at the time, had take, they had been taken to Carroll County Hospital and at that point, Lieutenant Gigler called Tim and they devised a plan. Tim went to the hospital, met with this young lady. And again, Lieutenant Gigler, along with Tim, helped convince her of the need to get into treatment immediately or she could lose her life. Recently, Tim reported that he ran into the young lady who's working at a local store now as a cashier, clean and sober, smiling and very grateful for the fact that Lieutenant Gigler helped her that evening. And these are just a few examples. I have several, but these are just a few examples to show that she really has gone above and beyond in ways to improve those that have addiction issues, which ultimately has simply improved the safety of the entire community in Hampstead. And for those reasons, it is my privilege to award the Bob Kirkland Award to Lieutenant Stacey Gabe. Okay, we're getting close to the main event here. Um, but I do, and I appreciate the opportunity to recognize uh, them. Sadly, Keith Mills was going to be here to speak to you, but, um, and he's really been a good friend of this vigil. He came out to the very first vigil uh, when we didn't know if anybody would show. I know that may seem hard to believe now. Um, but uh, he came out and has been a good friend and was going to be here tonight, but unfortunately last night, his mother got taken to the hospital and lives down in Florida, and he had to go down to, to be with her. So certainly join me in sending our prayers to him and his mother this evening. But uh, the, the one thing I will say is, you know, when we were talking earlier about where we stood in the lineup tonight, um, I thought I should have been cleanup hitter, but apparently, <laughs> apparently somebody thought they hit better than me. Uh, I will tell you, we are very honored uh, to have our keynote speaker join us tonight. Uh, Daryl Strawberry, drafted June 3rd, 1980 by the New York Mets as the number one pick in the Major League Baseball draft. He went on to an extremely successful 17-year 17, 17 career, both the New York Mets and the New York Yankees, although we like him anyway. <laughs> I could have forgiven the Mets. I uh, won Rookie of the Year, eight-time All-Star, three-time World Series champion. But frankly, and I t we, we had a great conversation tonight, I would say all of that, perhaps his biggest challenge, was uh, finding the road to recovery. And he, just in my talk with him tonight, he has his own story of addiction and his path of recovery to share with us tonight. It is extremely in inspirational. So without further ado, I would ask Daryl, come on forward. Wow, thanks Brian, thanks Tim, thanks everyone that I had the opportunity to spend some time with, dinner, um, to be here, to be here to talk about what's really important tonight. We all know the problem, but we need to get to the solution. The problem is all across America. 
kids dying everywhere like never before. And my story is no different than the other kids that are dying. For the grace of God, they go high. So let us pray. Father, we love you. Father, we bless this community. Father, I ask that your peace that surpasses all understanding will come over this night, that we will get into the solution what a community is supposed to be about when we have trials and tribulations, which we all sit in in America. We sit in a broken America, Father. Father, we need your grace to cover us. We need your strength to help us understand. But most of all, we need your mercy. Have mercy on us, Father. May we come to know you. May we come to have a better relationship with you that we may do your will as people, that we may gather like this tonight and change will come about. The hearts of people will be changed forever to know the purpose of their life. Those that are in recovery, those that are struggling, that they may know the purpose of why you created them. You created them for more than just themselves. You created them to use them mightily for your glory. Lord, we thank you for this night. And I just pray for this community. I pray for the lives that were lost. And I pray for the families that have lost loved ones and the sister, the brother, the child. Father, we need your love because your love is the greatest love of all. We bless you and honor you and praise you. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. 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 Well. I didn't really always used to be like this. I was very broken. I came from a very dysfunctional home. My dad was a raising alcoholic. He used to beat the crap out of me. When I was 13 years old, my father came home for the last time, pulled out a shotgun, and said he was going to kill the whole family. Me and my brothers came this close to killing my father. See, there could have been a tragedy in my life before I ever put on the baseball uniform. See, everybody just saw me put on the baseball uniform and be successful, and why was I so, so successful? It was because of the fact that my pain led me to my greatness, and my greatness led me to my destructive behavior. Because if I never deal with the brokenness of who I am inside, my whole life is gonna fall apart. And see, and that's what's happened across America. Brokenness is real, and young people are broken, and you know, lawlessness is real, and it, it brings about broken people. And if we never get a chance to heal inside, we can never be well. It doesn't matter what I look like on the outside. See, everybody just saw what I looked like on the outside. They figured I should have it all together because I was rich and famous. Yeah, I, I lived behind the community gates. I had millions of dollars. I had tons of success, but I was broken inside. See, addiction is just not about the drugs and the alcohol. It's about the behavior that comes of a person that has been broken and are, something traumatic has happened in their life. And you, know, you find out so many different things are happening in young girls' lives at the age of 18 and you know, why they OD in three or four times and why they use it because they've been molested, they've been raped, something has happened. And we don't want to talk about it. We don't, want to deal, we don't want to deal with the real stuff. See, we need to deal with the real stuff. When we start dealing with the real stuff, then people are able to get well. If we never deal with the real stuff, we just cover it up and keep saying, it's not in my neighborhood, it's not in my community. It's everywhere. I just left Pennsylvania. It's everywhere with the governor, 1700, a rally just like this. People are dying everywhere. And we got to get this right as, uh, as people. We got to get what's, what matters. We got to get away from the stigma of someone's a drug addict and, and he's a loser or something like that. He's not a loser. He's got a problem. He's sick. He's got an illness. We need to get to the place of loving them right where they're at. So nobody, so many people don't love people right where they're at. Everybody criti criticized me about my drug addiction because I was famous and I was in the spotlight. And they criticized me because I'm not supposed to have a drug problem because I'm making millions of dollars. Well, let me tell you, the devil is a liar. 
the reality of, of our society, if we don't deal with the principles of, of what we've been found on, and when we don't get back to the principles of what we've been found on, the enemy sweeps in here and he takes people's lives like mine and other people, and he brings them to their knees through drug addiction, and they don't know why they're like that, but they're just like that because they're broken inside. There's an emptiness that comes along inside of a person. I was empty. I was rich, famous, and had all that a man could possibly have and had all the success and, and was great at hitting home runs and winning championships, but that just made me a baseball player. It didn't make me a man. See, the real reality is we need to get back to what makes us hold and wholeness inside as people. And God uses people to help people. That's what this night is about. This night is not about me. This night is about all of us to fall in line with the biblical principles and let God come back in and let him heal this land and heal our people and heal our children. <laughs> we've, we've gotten completely away from the principles. We've gotten away from the principles why I said there is no more family talk at the table where we sit at the table and talk about real life and real things and talk about God's principles. See, these kids' life matter, but they're so broken, they're so separated, they're consumed with a lifestyle that's totally different than all of the rest of us. And we're all saying what's wrong with them, but see, we don't understand. The enemy has deceived them with all this other stuff, with MySpace, his space, Facebook, this, and Twitter, and all that. And they don't even have communication skills to know how to sit down and have a conversation and talk about what's really wrong with them. And it's up to us. Looking around, some of us are older and we know the foundation, we know the principles. It's up to us to go back and teach them the real principles and the real values of life. Because if we don't teach them, the world will take them and destroy them. And that's what happened to me. And God used my wife to bring me back. 14 years ago, I was smoking crack. I was shooting dope. I was lost. I was just wanting to die, just like every other kid wanting to die. Had it all, you know, been a major league baseball player, successful, and had it all, but with broken inside and empty inside because I was damaged inside because my father beat me and said I was nothing. And there was rejection for so many kids, broken homes, and they felt abandoned and they feel like nothing. See, relationships, life is really real. And when you realize you as a parent, when your life is broken and your relationships is broken, your kids will be broken. There's no getting around it. That's the real reality of it because that's what happened to me. I was broken and then I ended up breaking my kids. My kids ended up broken. See, but my kids were able to come back and be changed because I was transformed because my wife, my wife who was pulling me out of dope houses 14 years ago, talking about you're going to live, God's got a plan for you. I said, well, why don't he just let me die? She says, you're just not that lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us are not that lucky. Very fortunate because I was in a generation where the drugs today are not the same. Our kids, our families, the parents, you know, you need to get down to the tables and talk to your kids about drugs. Talk to them about prescription pills. Don't give them prescription pills. Don't let the doctor prescribe prescription pills. Make them take Tylenol, ibuprofen, just like we used to have to take it. We've, we've gotten to the place where we just so consumed with you know the medical field and the doctors and going, well, he has a bad shoulder, he hurt this, he hurt that. Take some Tylenol <laughs> and go lay down and go to sleep. <laughs> That's what we got to get back to. Let's not keep just going and allowing to use and go to the doctors and and get prescription pills. Because let me tell you something, when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, they get prescription pills, they're going to get addicted. Because their minds are not strong enough and those pills will alter their mind. Anything that alters your mind is addictive. 
Some of you think just smoking marijuana is okay, and you know, it won't. marijuana is the gateway to everything else. I started off on marijuana. I started off on Coke 45. I end up shooting dope. I end up smoking dope because it's just a gateway to everything else. That's the reality of, oh, he just smokes a little weed. He's all right. Well, guess what? One day the marijuana is going to stop working because everything that you take and everything that you use is going to stop working. and You're going to keep wanting more of this and more of that. They said I was bipolar, his polar, her polar. I ain't no polar today. Sometimes they miss the mark, you know. <laughs> We're not really all that, you know, and I, I never want to fall into that antidepressant pills and, and start taking that. And, and that's needed, don't get me wrong. But I wanted to get off everything. I needed to stop altering my mind because I'm a freaking addict. And when an addict alters his mind and an alcoholic alters himself, you're going to be in deep trouble, lost, deeply lost, because you're chasing something that's not really there. We don't know why we chase it, because of our brain. You know, our brain tells us all these crazy things and tells us we can't do this and we can't do that. And let me tell you, it is. It, our brain do come back once we stop using. When you really put the plug in the jug, when you really understand of your life and start realizing that your life matters. And it's not about what somebody else has said and what somebody else has done to you. See, there has to be a healing process. There has to be a spiritual healing inside of you. If there is no spiritual healing, you will never get well. So many of us search for it through this and that and, you know, and yeah, all the programs. Programs are great. There's no question. I went to the best of them. Betty Ford, Hanley Hazleton. I was just in denial. And as long as you stay in denial, you will never get well. As long as you stay in denial, well, no, nothing's wrong with me. You know, because she, she has an addict, we, we think, an alcoholic, we think, well, there's a different way to use. There's a different way to do this. I just use a little bit. No, you won't. You won't never use just a little bit. You won't never just drink a little bit. There is no different way. You know, there's only one way. See, we need to get back to the solution of, of what's wrong with this country. It's flooded with drugs now. And our kids are separated. And they're broken. And the enemy has come in and he's flooded across the whole United States of America, not just certain places, everywhere, killing all our kids. Because the system is broken, and we won't get back to the principles. And the principles and the solution of everything that will make us well and whole is Jesus Christ, is the biblical principles. That's what led me to be liberated and redeemed and set free. Never looked back over my shoulder when I was, when I was led to the biblical principles of my life. When my wife led me to the cross, my life changed forever. Because God is the one that has the grace, and his grace is sufficient for all of us to get well inside. Not what we look like on the outside. See, the inside is toxic. The brokenness goes on in the inside. If he doesn't come into your life and, and change you, you can never be free. You can be clean. But I see I, I needed, see, me personally, I needed to be more than just clean. I wanted to be free. And there's something about a freedom and a liberty to live. And understand, like I said, I was successful and had everything. See, most everybody think we want to push to have this and have that. And, you know, I played Major League Baseball. I was just a baseball player. I wasn't a man. I, wasn't, I, didn't, I didn't become a man until I met Jesus Christ. And when I came to the cross, then he cleaned me up. Now you see a new me, you know, because I had all the stuff. I had the homes, cars. But Jesus said, what good does it do for a man to profit the whole world and lose his soul? That was me. I had profit and gained all this stuff and lost my soul. See, because if you lose your soul, you're going to die. And that's what we got to get back to. We got to get back to the healing, you know, the healing process, the healing process. See, programs are, programs are amazing, but we need faith programs in this time, in this day.
to make, bring about a change. And I've seen it my own self. I have programs and I go to my treatment facilities and I teach the kids about Jesus Christ. And you know what they tell me? They said, I don't even know about God. I don't even know if God loves me. That just shows me how far broken the system is. That we've removed God from the schools, from them getting the education and the opportunity to know that God loves and cares about them. We've missed that. And we, and we need to bring that back. We, we need to stop being so shy and so, you know, with the stigma and what everybody else has to say, you know. They talked about me when I was a heathen and a drug addict. Now they talk about me because I love Jesus Christ. Get over it. They're going to talk about you anyway. <laughs> Just kind of, need, just, just kind of need to get over it. You know what? Because you know what? They can talk about me, but I'm free. You know, I'm well. I haven't had a desire to use drugs and alcohol in 14 years. My wife hadn't had a desire, and she led me. She's got 16 years. And it's because, it's because it's, and, and all programs are great. There's many ways and many pathways, you know, and every, you know, everybody wants to debate. Stop debating. See, we're debating about it. This is what this program is, this, this program is that, and God's not this, and you can't bring that in here. That's why people are dying. That's why the younger generation is confused. That's why they don't want to go to AA or NA. They, you, you got them all confused that, that if, they don't, if they don't do it this way, they don't talk this way, we need to get back to them being able to express themselves and talk. She, my wife worked with so many young people, and I asked her, why so many young people that you work with are so successful? She says, because I listen to them. Everybody else want to talk over them. We want to tell them what they need, need to do instead of listening to, listening to their hurt. We need, to get back, we need to get back to listening to what they're saying. Then more lives may be saved. We need to not stop telling, we need to stop telling them they're crazy and, and, and you didn't sign up for it. No, nobody signed up, they didn't sign up for it either. But something's happened. Something's happened in their life. And we need to respect that, that something's happened in their life. And we need to be able to help them right where they're at. People ask me, well, why, why are so many people successful uh, with you and your wife? Because we don't care about things. You know, God has blessed us. We got homes. We got big homes, stuff like that. But we take kids and we put it in there that's struggling with addiction. We send them to drug treatment centers, you know, uh, because we care. Um, that's what it's really all about. It's not about anything else because that was us one day. That used to be us. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying for all of us, it's, it's about action, getting into action and caring about people. Because guess what? Every last one of us that's in here, God loved you first before you even got here. And we never need to forget about no one. No one's a mistake. I don't care how far they go down the scale, no one's a mistake. No one is a mistake. Everybody in the Bible had issues. God used them mightily. They all had issues just like us. But God used them mightily. Moses couldn't even speak. He had an anger problem, killed the Egyptian man. Moses used him mightily. We're no different. See, the problem is we've gotten away from that. We've gotten away from, our society's gotten away from it and think we're different. We're not, no, we're just a different generation. We just got a bunch of stuff here and that, that consumes us and makes us, you know, get away from what, what, what is real and what's the true foundation. We didn't got away from that. We didn't got away from the principles, the biblical principles of living. I'm free. I got joy. There's a great joy in my life. There is no hangover in my head about my addiction problem. I'm free to go out and do and help somebody else and make a difference in somebody else's life. And that's what this is really all about. It's about you getting free to make a difference in someone else's life. And you that don't have a drug problem, this is your community. you supposed to rally around the leaders in the community that's working with to help people, you're supposed to rally around and say, well, that's not my problem. Well, one day your kid may have that problem. 
We need to pay attention, all of us, to what's important. And you know what's important to God? People. Not, not because you're successful. The greatest thing about I love about Jesus is what he loved. He loved the lost and the broken. And we need to get back to loving them right where they're at. You guys that are here tonight that are in treatment, let me tell you something. Your life matters. No matter what you're going through. You that are in treatment, that are here tonight, or someone that's struggling, you're the most important person in this room tonight. And all the rest of us, we have the ability and the gift to rise up and help someone else to make a difference in your own community. Stop sitting around flicking the television. The television ain't going to make you well. Stop looking at the news. There's nothing but horrible things on the news. Get out in your community. Go visit some of you. You need to go visit some of these people that are struggling, that are in an addiction problem. And you don't need to talk over them. You need to listen to them just to hear their pain. Because their pain is real. We don't know where people come from. Don't ever forget. See, most people, most people couldn't imagine why I was so broken and, and inside. I was already scarred because of my father, the beatings. He told me I was nobody. So I started drinking and smoking marijuana at the age of 14, 15. I was already broken before I put the uniform on. But I became a baseball player because I was in pain. And plus, I wanted to beat up on the Oreos. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> but, in, but, but in the real reality of, of my life today is it, it's, not about, it's not about me. It's not about being a great baseball player. It's about being a man that has been transformed by the power of God, that love people, that care for people that are struggling with addiction. And that means I will go to any length to make a difference to help an addict or an alcoholic that's still suffering. So all of us must remember the purpose of our life. It's not about us. It's not about what I achieve. It's about what Christ has already done on the cross. He's already finished it for all of us. All we have to do is enter in. And just remember what Romans 8, 28 says, and we know all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord to those who are called according to his purpose. God's got a great purpose, great plan for all of us. None of you are a mistake. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever, ever, ever give up. Don't quit. Because there's a victory on the other side. People may not believe in you, but let me tell you something. I believe in you. People didn't believe in me. But look, taste and see that the Lord is good. He transformed me and changed me because people didn't believe in me. But just know that he sees all and he knows all and, and he, he has the perfect plan for all of us. And all we have to do, those that are struggling, those that might think they want to go down the road, don't ever touch drugs, don't ever touch alcohol. Because it's a dead end road. There's nothing great about it. The literature says what, where we all end up, jails, institution, and death. It's not a game. It's a real reality that I live. I should be dead after shooting dope and, and smoking crack and ended up with a T17169 at Florida State Prison. See, God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Had cancer twice and lost my left kidney. You're looking at a living miracle. When you walk out of here tonight, you're going to know that you saw a living miracle. <laughs> and that's the hope that I hope to bring to people everywhere I go across the country, a living miracle because of God's grace. And I just hope people will take hold of that and take heed to that 
and know that your life matters. And to all you that have lost loved ones through addiction, and I met young lady tonight, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. It's real. And we don't understand, you know, there's no returning once a loss is gone. So while we have a chance here to do something different, we all need to do something different. Community leaders, we all need to put ourselves together. Brian, thanks. Tim, thank you guys. These guys have tremendous passion for this community and what they're doing. And those that receive the awards, thank you guys for stepping up. It takes people to step up. We need to, we need to get outside of ourselves and never be selfish and always look at the person that is sick and suffering and realize that they need more help than we do. Let me close in a prayer. Father, I thank you for your words, for your people. I thank you for this community. I thank you for the leaders. I pray that they will involve themselves more, open up more homes, recovery homes for those that are, can't afford to be in treatment, that they will have a place to go and, and get life and find a new life and find a new way. Father, I just send this petition up to you, Yon, and I ask that you will seal it and that something great will come out of this night. Lives will be changed forever. People will believe, those in treatment, they will have hope because they have stood up, have sat down here and seen a man stand up here and seen a living miracle, a man be changed by you. I give you all honor and praise for this wonderful night, and we bless you in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you guys and bless you guys for having me. That's uh, obviously, you can see what I meant by imagine sitting across the dinner table from that. Um, you can't help but get up and want to shout. Uh, I thank you so much, Daryl. And I, and I just, I will tell you, we talked a little bit about it, but I can't, for those that have struggled with recovery, I can't imagine doing that under a national bright light. And I just think it shows such a strength in your own character that although you were down at a time that obviously you had some strength within. And I, again, I want to thank you again. For coming back. As we move into the reading of names and candle lighting, I would ask uh, our law enforcement representatives to please come forward at this time. And as they approach, I'm going to, our next speaker uh, who will begin reading the Names is well known to many of you. He's an inspiration for many with his own dedication and hard work in helping those battling addiction. Um, he certainly has his own inspirational story of how a better life is possible with recovery. My uh, very good friend and our state's attorney's office's drug treatment and education liaison, Tim Weber. So I'm, I'm already going off script. <laughs> if, uh, I mean, a lot of you know, I'm, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Uh, I haven't had a drink or a drug since November 8, 2003. For that, I'm truly grateful. <laughs> but if you're comfortable with this, if you're someone that is in recovery uh, from drug and alcohol addiction, have recovered, or in recovery, whatever the case may be, if you're comfortable. Now, if you're in the back, you just stick your hand straight up. But if you're in a seat, stand up in here if you're in, in, in some kind of recovery.
It's our duty. It's what we should do is carry a message like this. This part of the program with Daryl speaking is the message of hope, you know, the, that, that tells us that with addiction, on the other side of addiction, there can be recovery. And no matter how far down the scale we go, we have a message that can help someone else and, and help pull them out of that. And that's, uh, uh, it's something that we should all do. And you see there's a room full of people that are ready to go out and do that stuff and, and, and pull people in and show them that there's a better way to live. And uh, we're all really blessed to be in a position that way. Uh, now this is the part of the program where we read the names of all the people that we've lost as a result of an overdose in our county and in our state through the years. This is probably the saddest part of the night, but it's also the most healing part of the night. It's, in, honest, in all honesty, it's probably the most healing part of the year for many of us to come together and to do this. So when I read the name of someone, step into the, into the center aisles, uh, if you're a loved one, if you're a friend and you want to come up and you want to have a candle lit, grab one of the candles that, that the ladies will have out, come up to the officers, light your candle, and then go to the left and to the right so we can encircle the, the, the whole portico. And, and uh, it's, a moving, it's a moving part of the program. I apologize in advance if I don't get a name perfectly right. I can... Trust me when I tell you I've gone over these and tried to really do it to the best of my ability. Luke DeBell. Ryan Gabaya. Kathy Liebneck. Brendan Huber. John Schenkel. Christopher Eric Parrish, Pamela Buckley, Christopher Hammer, Christian Sinat, Sheldon Parrish, Michael Hayes, Rick Rennie, Jamie McCann, Gregory Nelson, Bradley Hagner, Tommy Rowan, Russell Thomas Neal Jr., Louis Frock, Heather Phillips, Joey Veneri, Modesta L. Lee, Derek Carrington, Michael Scott Payne, Philip Keith Davis, Liam O'Hara, Ricky Palin, Anthony Hunt, Sean Littlejohn, Justin Orrett, Charles Schrouder III, Steve Crable, Matthew Basama, Ryan Eric Rosidi. Jason Michael Patty, Neam Kate Ty, Seth James Laura, Augie Hart, Stephen M. Bollinger, Thomas Allen Hall, Emily Sullivan, Kimberly Michael Anderson, Kimberly Michelle Anderson, Nicole Rentelli, Sean Michael Schmidt, Joseph Danielle, Daniel Hubbard, Kunda Hines, Elizabeth Ann Knight, Richard David DeMuth, Shelby Caroline Wilson, Brian Scott Farrell, Gregory Clinton Mayer, Kenny Mullaney, Stephen Bowman, Chris Lloyd Peterson, 
Marcus Joseph Pascal, Tony Higgins, Anthony Michael Demera Jones, John Christopher Keogh, Kenny Anthony Denny, Benjamin Michael Fisher, Michelle Lee Long, Zachary Matthew Owan, John Michael Nieberlin, Garrett Kelly, Kevin Owens Saul, Robert Mason Lofink, William Kenneth Thompson, Christopher Lucas Rambo, Jacob Christopher Melton, Richard Patrick Young Murray, James Doyle, Andy McDonald, Anthony James Hudman, Terry Rocky James, Robert Miller, Aaron Allball, Thomas James Hardesty, Melissa Selden, Ryan Ballista, Alex Michael Eberts, Jake Edward Janik, Thomas Manley Raver, Joseph William Latch, Dana Robert Bender, Robert Rocky Underwood Sr., Diana Smith, Arch Mueller, Jr., Norman James Willis, Charles Ray Harris, Dan Deladon, Deanna Lynn Leonard, David Allen Harris, Brandon Wesley Clark, Ashley Suzanne Jenkins, Kelly Marie Hall, Bradley Joseph Mullen, GSP Roberto Passaretti, Brandon Michael Cutler, Sarah Jane Sherman, James Lee Sheets, Jason Craig Barry, William Martin Noble, Jason Philip Swagger, Jonathan Michael Hagee, John Emery Davis, Kenneth Maurice Griffin, Harold Wayne Parker, Rachel Janice Broadbeck, Aaron Cooper Stars, Robert Joseph Reed, Albert John Bangs Jr., James Zablowski, Melissa Diane Freeman, Taylor Sprague, William Smith, Brandon Marshall Smith, Brooke Fiorentino, Eddie G. Keeslin, Tanya Renee Gore, Renee Lynn Owens, Elizabeth Ann Knight, Glenn Scott Kidd, Emily Kathleen Summerhill, Sarah Ann Croner, Alan Lee Little, Richard Lewis Morris, Jr., Melody Carl Johnson, Raymond J. Suggett II, Brandon Lee Kerrigan, Corey Joseph Chilcote, David Allen Jett, Kimberly Ann Niswander, Teresa 
Ann Petticord, Jared Martin Keel, Sandra Jane Snodick, John Patrick Marley, James Kevin Groves, Herbert Charles Hilton, Courtney Taylor Case, Lauren Nicole Cocker, James Lee Palmer, Kelly Denise Lee, Tammy Lynn Smith, Terrence Lee Burt, Charles Dwayne Morton, Jenny Lee Shaw, David Leroy Johnson, Joshua Scott Patterson, Brian Dale Baker, James Gates, John Walker, Nathan James Cochran, Allison Jill Koppel, Crystal Gail Harrison, Hunter Thomas Prosser, Justin Michael Bowen, Nelson Paul White, Danielle Wayne King, Michael Earl Fox, Melanie Marie Marrero, Jeffrey Stewart Ballista, Matthew Philip Bridenstein, Thomas Eugene Hardy, Desiree Shrouder, Trey Atkins, Jenny Lee Shaw Lubin, Tawny Nicole Boucher, Sarah Louise Farmer, Michael Scott Sheets, Amanda Ann Trent, Bud Gross, Kristen Marie Spurrier, Michael Bruce Crockett, James Tweedy Patrick. And if there's a name that didn't get read and you want to just get a candle and have it lit and come around, feel free to come, come into the aisle and do it. At this time, I would ask Dean, uh, Deacon Steve Rozier, who also happens to be our prosecutor in our office, uh, to come forward and provide us some words.
Thank you, Brian. And Daryl, a special thanks to you for your story tonight and especially for your witness of the healing power of Almighty God. You know, we've gathered here tonight at this vigil as a people with many different perspectives on the issue of substance abuse and addiction. Some are here in their roles as advocates. There are those who are here from law enforcement and the justice system. There are many who are here who are successfully addressing their addiction and are in recovery and maintaining their sobriety. There's still others who are currently struggling to gain control of the addiction that currently grips them. And finally, there are those who are loving parents, grandparents, siblings, children, close friends of those who are in the throes of addiction or sadly, those who have witnessed the loss of life of someone they hold dear to the ravages of drugs. We're surrounded by lights here tonight and let the light of these candles that burn brightly now serve as signs and symbols of our love, our memory, our strength, and hope for those that we have lost and for those who struggle and for those who seek to maintain a journey to freedom from addiction. And I invite those here who so desire to bow your heads in prayer. Almighty, good, and gracious Lord, we gather tonight as people of many different denominations and faith perspectives. We know you as Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, as a power greater than ourselves, and as our loving Heavenly Father God. Despite our differences, we're here unified in our sincere desire to break the destructive chains of drug abuse and addiction. And we ask you, God, to send your Holy Spirit to fill the needs of all here present. To those in law enforcement, we pray. For those in the justice system, we pray. Lord, give them the light to have the wisdom to never lose sight of the human dignity of people who are gripped by addiction. May they find the proper balance between the need to protect society and the desire to assist women and men to free themselves from the prison of addiction. We pray for those who render aid to people addicted to drugs. Lord, give them the light of patience to realize that the road to recovery is one often with many potholes and turns. May they have the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or judgmental or upset with the men and women they are assisting on the path to be free of addiction. We pray, too, for those who have gained control of their lives in the face of drug addiction. Lord, give them the light of fortitude to maintain their journey of their present sobriety and serve as beacons of support and friendship to the men and women who are currently trying to find their way to recovery. We pray, too, for those who are presently abusing drugs and desperately seek to find the right road to recovery. Lord, give them the light of hope that will eliminate the darkness, the fear, the despair that comes upon those held captive by the chains of addiction. Let that light lead them to fulfilling the dignity of life that they so desperately desire. And finally, Lord, to those who have lost someone close to them, to the scourge of drug abuse, addiction, and death, Lord, we pray, give them the light of healing. For many here tonight, that sad fate has left an emptiness that cannot be adequately described. Send your Holy Spirit, God, to implant in their emptiness of heart the memory of better days. Instill in them the feelings of love that were shared and give them the faith that tells us that the end of our bodily life is not an end to your boundless love and mercy. 
Give those who are left behind comfort in their sorrow, hope in their despair, and the wisdom to find ways to help others tread the path that they now walk in dealing with the loss of someone dear. And with thanks, Lord, in faith, hope, and love, we turn to you, good and gracious God, confident that you will fill our emptiness and relieve our pain and give us the wisdom to be your hands, your voice, and your heart to those who come into our lives in desperate need of your help. Bless us, Father, as we turn our eyes to you and give us peace now and in the year to come. And let the people say, Amen. Thank you uh, for the benediction, Steve. <clears throat> I want to thank Glenn, uh, Eric, Tim, Daryl for speaking tonight. The most persuasive voice in educating parents and friends on how to help, to educate the community on what is happening, and to educate those addicted how to get help are those that are or have been directly affected. Sharing your pain and your life journeys as to addiction is something we are all grateful that you did with us tonight. I want to give a special thank you to Carroll Media Center for broadcasting the event tonight for those who could not attend in person, and St. John's for providing us this beautiful venue. I want to give a big thank you to Tina Gerald who worked to ensure the vigil would be a fitting honor to those that have been lost, and certainly to all the members of my office who I put in a lot of time and effort to help support this event. I'm very grateful for that. In closing, I hope tonight you can see as you look around this room that's filled with candles that you are not alone. That many families and friends here tonight, many who could not attend, have experienced the same pain that you have. Together, as a community, we mourn tonight but let us leave with a renewed purpose to educate others so that we may prevent that heartache and that pain that you're experiencing tonight from growing. At this time, you can extinguish the candles and take them with you. I hope you will stay for refreshments. Thank you all very much for coming this evening. God bless. <laughs>